Welcome to the third lecture in the second module in the Network Softwareization course. Today's lecture is going to be about spatial division multiplexing. And I'll be telling you uh, some issues that arrive in how we are trying to push the capacity of optical fiber by turning towards this new, new type of multiplexing. So the outline of our discussion today is going to be the following. We're going to start with some motivation and some context on where spatial division multiplexing uh, enters in in the development of new technologies, new solutions to push the capacity of optical networks. And we'll give a little taxonomy of spatial division multiplexing, explaining to you what the variety of uh, approaches we can use for this solution. One of the uh, solutions is going to be multiple core fibers. So I'll start with that. It's the simplest, simplest com, um, concept for spatial division multiplexing. And from there, we'll move on to something called few mode fibers. And in order to understand how few mode fibers are able to increase capacity and some of the advantages of this solution, I'll have to start by explaining to you what eigenmodes are in a fiber. And from eigenmodes, I'll expand the discussion to talk about different kinds of modes that are propagated in a fiber. And two of the most uh, interesting types of modes that we'll be covering are the linearly polarized modes and the orbital angular momentum modes, or OAM modes. And after that, I'll give you a few concluding remarks. Along the way, I'll also be talking to you about some enabling technologies and at the very end, talk with about the implications are for networking as we try to adopt this new multiplexing uh, strategy. So if you recall the last time, we had a discussion about increasing the capacity of optical fiber running into a limit, and this was known as the Shannon limit. And we talked about how we can squeeze to get closer to the Shannon limit the first approach was just to use faster electronics. So instead of sending a, a, a fairly long pulse, I would send shorter and shorter pulses, thereby increasing the uh, throughput, so by increasing the symbol rate. Another way to push towards the Shannon capacity is to use wavelength division multiplexing. So in the wavelength domain, to send my signal uh, whose bandwidth finally is determined by how short a pulse I have. But no matter how short I get it, it'll occupy some bandwidth, and then I can just load these bandwidths one next to another by multiplexing the wavelength. The next way we saw of increasing capacity was to use advanced modulation. And that was to allow us to send information in the polarization state of the light. There are two polarizations. So we have two times as much because we can send one on each polarization, one uh, stream of data on each polarization. And the other way to increase capacity was to change the number of bits per symbol. And that means we would increase the uh, number of points in a constellation. And here we have a little graph that shows us going from uh, two points or binary signaling to uh, two bits per, signal, uh, per symbol which leads to QPSK signaling and, uh, of course, other possibilities we can scale up in that direction also. So by pushing towards the Shannon capacity by each of these techniques, we could see historically how this had been used to increase the overall capacity of the optical fiber. So in this plot, we have uh, on the x-axis axis time and years and in the y-axis, the capacity in bits per second of the optical fiber. And we could see that in the first wave, we were just going with faster electronics. And that allowed us to increase. Then we found new devices that allowed us to do uh, wavelength multiplexing in a very cost-effective fashion. And then we saw a, a big increase in uh, capacity of the channel. After that, we saw the adoption of advanced modulation formats, and that's the most recent and one that's now available in commercial products. And now we have coming along uh, today the development of what we call space division multiple access. And we see this as a way of continuing 
the capacity increases that we've enjoyed over previous years. So I didn't tell you quite the whole story the last time. The last time I talked to you about the Shannon limit, and the Shannon limit applied to any additive white Gaussian noise channel. Now the optical fiber channel has some uh, behavior which is not well described by such a system. And the reason is due to what we call nonlinear effects. Optical fibers are pretty thin, as I'm sure you know. And the core of the fiber, which is the waveguide of the fiber, which is where all the light is confined, is only about 8 microns across. So as I've been pushing to put, for instance, more wavelengths on this same uh, core of light that, that, that um, guides the light, more signals, more wavelengths, means that I'm increasing the power that I'm launching into this optical fiber. And because it's so small, I end up by arriving at something like megawatts per square centimeter, which is being launched into this very fine fiber. Because the, the power is so high, the concentration of power is so high, I uh, run into nonlinear effects on my signal uh, in this fiber. So in a way, as I push more power into the, the transmission, I'm actually getting worse performance. So this is in part of Shannon's theory and his limit as developed. And so if we have to take into this account, uh, we're actually in worse shape uh, than we thought. For instance, here's a plot of the total launched power and here we have the quality factor squared. So it tells us how good the, the, signal, the signal quality is. So one would expect typically that as I increase the power, well, my signal gets better. However, at some point, that's true, but as I reach a certain point, launching more power actually makes my performance go down. And this is because I'm starting to induce more and more nonlinearities. And the nonlinearities induced are stopping uh, the advancement of the quality of the signal. And these uh, different plots uh, show how this happens for uh, different uh, kinds of fibers. We could try to do some digital signal processing to alleviate the nonlinear effects. And th that helps us. It pushes us farther out. But there's no getting around it completely, no, matter, uh, no amount of complexity. So, uh, we're always running into what we call the uh, nonlinear effects and the nonlinear limits. So let's translate that into what happens to the Shannon limit. So this black dotted line is the Shannon limit we saw last week. So this is the signal to noise ratio versus the capacity. And sometimes signal to noise ratio is not enough because, as I mentioned, um, increasing the power will not necessarily increase the signal-to-noise ratio. And because of that, we see that the uh, nonlinear Shannon limit uh, is actually uh, visible here. So let's see if we can plot this um, nonlinear Shannon limit. And in this case, it looks similar to what we saw for the previous plot, except uh, we're writing spectral efficiency in bits per second per hertz for the y-axis, and in fact, this is capacity, uh, an equivalent way uh, of writing it. Um, here we have, instead of SNR, we have transmission distance. Because we can think of, uh, for a given signal power, uh, the signal-to-noise ratio is going to go down as I go farther and farther distances because of the attenuation to the signal power. So this is just another way to parameterize um, Shannon's limit. So we've got a couple of things plotted here. First of all, in the red is the nonlinear Shannon limit, and anything above that is unachievable in this fiber. The blue dots represent sort of the state of the art of experimentation that's been going on with uh, wavelength division multiplexing. And we can write a blue line through those uh, experimental representations to show us sort of where we stand in advancing towards the Shannon limit. Yellow is what uh, are being sold commercially now. And so it's a bit farther. These experiments show us where the technology is pushing. And we should be we can see that we're making prog progress toward the nonlinear Shannon limit. 
I'll just mention that there's another y-axis on the side here. And in this case, we take the spectral efficiency and we multiply it by the uh, amount of bandwidth which is available uh, in the C-band. So this is the main band for long distance uh, optical transmissions. And this gives us an idea in bits, uh, terabits per second about how much information we can actually push through the optical fiber, uh, of course, as a function of distance. And this lets us see that um, the current state of the art is about, oh, I don't know, maybe a factor of two behind the nonlinear Shannon limit, which means there's not much growth room available as we improve our systems. And in the face of this fact that we're running into this limit, we're pushing our technology, we're trying to get closer, but in the meantime, global uh, traffic continues to grow exponentially. And we can see here that we're talking about terabits per second capacity, and that being capped in the optical fiber. And we're talking about exabytes uh, per month, a million times larger number. Um, and you know, the, the, the concern is that the optical fiber is not scaling up in capacity to keep up with demand. And so we ask ourselves, how is it that we can get around this nonlinear Shannon limit and continue to have uh, increased capacity while, of course, also trying to drive down the price uh, per bit of our communications? So let's look at what we can do in order to improve um, the capacity. Let's start with looking at what the Shannon limit says to us about a single fiber transmission. Suppose I try to send a high order modulation. You know, I really want to push the number of uh, bits per symbol. Because I'm doing that, I'm not going to be able to, I'm trying to get an advanced uh, bit per symbol, and I'm going to run into a certain maximum distance that I can travel at that spectral efficiency. So because of that, if I want to go farther than this limit, that means that I have to regenerate my signal and then retransmit it, et cetera. So if I want to go uh, 10,000 kilometers, maybe I'll have to have several repeaters along the way. So the repeaters, they add two things. They add cost and complexity, but then they also add um, you know, power consumption. So it's less green uh, because I have to use these repeaters. So let's say that I just look at this capacity limit and I start thinking about another, another solution instead of this idea of repeaters. Suppose I use a couple of fiber, so maybe a fiber bundle, something like what we see up here. I have a bunch of fibers available and I think about using uh, these in parallel. Uh, if I use them in parallel, maybe I, one strategy would be to be using a lower spectral efficiency, so just four points in my constellations, for instance. But because of that, maybe I'll be able to go my entire 10,000 kilometers without having to do any regeneration. And so, of course, I'll be consuming uh, less um, energy, and also uh, I'll have less equipment required. And let's look at how this idea scales if we look back at this um, capacity. Well, let's take an example. Suppose I wanted to go um, like a thousand kilometers, and I might, I don't know, maybe six uh, bits per second, uh, bits, uh, symbols per bit, bits per symbol, excuse me. So I want to go, uh, that, that means that I can go a thousand, but suppose I really want to go three thousand. So in order to be able to go three thousand, well, I'll have to have three, essentially three links. So I'll have to have three uh, transceivers that I use. And that'll let me get my 3,000. Now let's suppose I use the other strategy. So the other strategy, I'm at fewer bits, only two bits per second per hertz. So I can go past 3,000 and have some performance. If I were to take my solution, this only needed one transceiver pair. If I use three times as many transceivers, my, my goodness, I could make 
all kinds of improvements. I could go farther. I could send more uh, bits per second per hertz because these lines describe what I could do with the same hardware, the same number of transceivers, if I put them in parallel instead of uh, using repeaters to achieve the distance. For instance, uh, these lines, of course, now we see these two things plotted together. In red, we see how we scale by using um, repeaters in order to achieve distance. And in the other, in the blue lines, we see how we use parallel fibers in order to achieve distance. And we can see that the idea of parallel fiber channels allows us to um, make big savings in hardware complexity and also in um, power efficiency. This um, star plotted here, for instance, is a requirement to send 20 bits per second per hertz over a 1500 kilometer link. And we can see that you know, less than three uh, transceivers would be needed in the case of parallel tracks, whereas I'd need something like 300 uh, if I um, wanted to go with the, the repeater solution. And so it's, you know, on the order of 100 times saving in, in power. So this has been an argument for why I would like to look at the solution set of parallel uh, channels, parallel optical channels, to get from uh, point A to point B uh, with the greener solution. So it has less hardware, less electro-optic regeneration, and the electro-optic regeneration is a big consumer of power. So by avoiding this, I've really used a lot less power. So the question remains, how is it that I go about achieving the parallel optical paths? One obvious uh, solution is, uh, as I showed you in the illustration, is to just use a bundle of fibers. So I take the fibers that I use today in commercial systems, and I just put a bunch of them down between point A and point B instead of using a single fiber. But there's another way to do this, and now I'm starting to get into the taxonomy of spatial multiplexing, because we can think of a fiber bundle as being in space, a collection of fibers, and uh, I'm laying down in the same space a number of, of fibers. The other idea we can do is to take a single fiber and to find a way to send parallel paths within that single fiber. So spatial division multiplexing applies to all these situations. So let's think about just this concept about how would I build a taxonomy uh, for spatial division multiplexing. So, so far I've been looking at n separate fibers. And this cost uh, scales uh, linearly uh, with n. And I said that not only did I want to increase capacity, but I wanted to keep down the price per bit. So separate fibers doesn't help me with the costs. The costs um, are, are not going down even though my capacity is going up. So what I want to do is take advantage of integration because integration is always the key to bringing down uh, bits, uh, the cost per bit. So the integration I'm proposing to use now is to put these optical paths within an optical fiber, within one optical fiber, and to somehow have the other elements in the link also have a benefit from this idea of integration. Of course, integration doesn't come for free. Integration is going to lead to um, crosstalk among channels. When I have the separate fiber solution here, these uh, fibers are truly isolated from one another and have virtually no impact on one another when, when data is being transmitted through it. However, as I try to look for solutions where I'm packaging these spatial paths actually in a tight uh, physical uh, cross-section, that's going to mean that uh, the presence of a signal on one of these paths is going to influence the other, which we call uh, crosstalk.
So the idea again, we're going to go um, avoid electronic generation. We're going to use parallel fiber systems. One way is the fiber bundle, where I have absolutely separate fibers each the way along the link. And the second way, as I said, is to combine these fibers, these pads, into one fiber. So how do I make a fiber with multiple channels? How am I going to achieve that? Certainly I require a new kind of fiber in order uh, to go with this new kind of spatial division multiplexing. So I'm going to have to um, certainly have transceivers which are higher capacity because they're going to have to feed uh, this larger capacity. And integration will certainly help uh, keep the cost down for that. I also have to develop uh, new amplifiers. So I don't know if you recall, but I mentioned that when we went to wavelength division multiplexing, one of the reasons for the fast adoption and incredible increase in capacity when we moved to WDM was because we had something called the erbium doped fiber amplifier. So that amplifier was able to amplify all wavelengths present in the fiber so the cost of the uh, EDFA could be leveraged across all of the wavelength uh, channels, which is what brought the price down. So when I look for an amplifier, I'm going to be looking for an integrated solution. What I mean by integrated is I'm going to try and find a way of amplifying all my modes at the same time, rather than having to uh, take these parallel paths within one um, fiber separate them out, amplify them independently, and then put them together. If I do that, then I still have a cost which is growing linearly with my capacity. And I want to be able to um, keep the price down. So I require amplifiers. And of course, I also require switches. And we'll be talking more about the switches um, at the very end of uh, the presentation today. But um, it's important to realize that we're developing an ecosystem, all of the different technologies, components, uh, in order to make spatial division multiplexing uh, a reality, especially a commercial reality. So in addition to these um, components, we just need multiplexers to take um, a sing uh, one path, combine them together so that they launch into the fiber as one path, uh, one uh, physical conduit between the two points. So we need multiplexers, we need connectors, and connectors themselves can be uh, uh, challenging, splitters, etc. So the, the variety of all the kinds of uh, everyday uh, components that we find in an optical communications lab have now got to be redesigned in order to support um, these multiple optical paths. So how am I going to get multiple paths to go down a fiber? In order to explore the possibilities, I'll start by just t discussing the typical fiber today, which is a single mode fiber. It has a single core, and a single mode is propagated down that core. So in this uh, little illustration, the red is what I call the core or the waveguide. This is where the light actually prop propagates. And the yellow is called the cladding. And it's the cladding that combines the optical field to stay within the optical core. And the way we achieve this is by having different uh, effective, uh, excuse me, different refractive indices for these two materials. So we design a fiber so that um, in the end we create what's called a single mode, which goes through this um, core. And I'll be talking about that more. So, you know, within this core, of course, we've done all of the other um, ways of pushing the capacity of this uh, single core fiber. We've used a high baud rate, 56 gigabaud. We've used many, many wavelengths. We've used dual polarization. We've used 16 QAM, higher order modulation. And so we're really pushing to get the most we can out of this one core. So when I want to spatial multiplex, imagine that I develop a new kind of fiber. For instance, we know historically that one thing we can do with the fiber is simply to make the core larger. And when I make the core larger, 
I'm going to have multiple modes which are supported in that core. Multiple modes. And these modes all travel along the waveguide, but they have a distinct um, optical signatures, which we'll call modes. I just showed here an illustration of another uh, geometry we might use in an optical fiber. So this is a solid core, and this is what we call a ring core. So a ring-shaped waveguide is also a possibility and has some, some nice features. Maybe conceptually an easier way to look at it is just supposing the cladding is pretty big compared to the core. The core is 8 microns. Typical cladding is like 125 microns. So suppose I just put multiple cores inside of the cladding. Each one of these cores could be a single mode. It could carry the load that I mentioned earlier of 56 gigabyte, etc., etc. So just putting multiple instantiations of the typical core, single mode core, is one way to scale up. Now if we take these two ideas, here's a core which can support multiple modes, here's multiple cores. I could eventually, and, and this has been shown experimentally, actually use um, multiple cores, but each one of those cores could support multiple modes. So this is the taxonomy of spatial division multiplexing, the different ways that I can achieve uh, a multiplicative factor increase uh, in capacity, even though it's one physical fiber which is supporting uh, the transmission. So there are many challenges in spatial division multiplexing. It's an extremely hot topic, and uh, it's seen to be not guaranteed. It's still a research topic, but it has a lot of promise to be to uh, continue the trend of reducing the cost per bit. So it's twofold. One is increasing the capacity, certainly, but we can increase capacity with a fiber bundle. But if we want to uh, recruit, reduce the cost per bit, we have to go to these other solutions, and we have to have uh, integration in order to make it effective. So the Integration is in terms of the components. We need multiplexers and demultiplexers. Um, way to get um, multiple channels of information into this, uh, whether it's a multi-core or a multi-mode. We need um, sources that generate the modes that we need. We need amplifiers, couplers, fibers, uh, again, the whole ecosystem. We also need to understand better what are the theoretical limits of what can be achieved with this approach of spatial division multiplexing. So there's a lot of digital signal processing complexity that is enabling uh, this idea of space division multiplexing, which I'll uh, be talking about today. There certainly are going to be limits due to crosstalk, and this idea of DSP complexity is going to be closely related to the level of crosstalk. So how much crosstalk can I overcome? What kind of effort do I need to overcome it? And what we're really looking for are the scaling factors. How much can I grow this solution? Is it going to cap off after two modes, 10 modes, 100 modes? And uh, that's in an open question. So let's begin with the conceptually easier um, approach, which is to simply put uh, many cores into uh, the cladding. For instance, um, I would like to have my performance be such that although I have multiple cores, each core appears to be a completely independent channel. So one core does not impact on the other core. We want to design the fiber. It's a new fiber. We're going to change our design. And we want to keep the interactions between these cores as low as we can. So. While I want to keep the interactions low, I have to keep into take into account um, some implementation constraints. For instance, I've got to make this uh, fiber easy to produce, to be mass, mass produced, to be able to be a cost effective component. I'm going to have to find a way to amplify it. So perhaps the layout of cores is going to influence how well I can amplify um, all of the cores at once, for instance. I also have to be able to couple into this. 
And if I make the um, tolerances too tight, it may be very difficult just to splice two uh, fibers together, for instance, or create a, a coupler in order to splice them together. So all of this together means that there are some scalability issues. Just uh, how much can I, how many cores can I put into a, an optical fiber? What is it that's uh, uh, limiting me and is uh, imposing some scalability constraints? So let's talk about, well, how big can a fiber be? A fiber needs to be flexible. It has to be deployed uh, in many different geographical situations. So we worry about the mechanical reliability of the fiber. If the fiber becomes too big, then it becomes brittle. And when I try to uh, put the fiber around a, uh, a curved area, uh, it will actually snap off instead of, of uh, coiling and con continuing transmission. So what we have here is a plot of the cladding diameter, so how thick the cladding of the fiber is, versus uh, the relative failure probability. And we have here two curves, one in black and one in red. And in black, that's where we're sure of this probability within 1%. Uh, the red curve is relaxed constraints. You know, we're within, uh, we have a confidence interval of 2% about this uh, relative failure probability. So it's called relative. Why do we call it relative? Because I said that the standard single mode fiber is 125 microns. And so we'll call whatever that probability of failure is, let's call that 1. So that's where we are today. We use single mode fiber and we've uh, developed uh, the technology of the fiber to a point that we know what the failure rate is of this one within some tolerance level. So I start uh, increasing the size of my cladding and of course the probability of failure starts to grow. And it grows and if I want to get to the point where I achieve the same probability of fiber that I'm willing to tolerate now with a 125 micron solution, I get up to something that maybe is 250 microns. So maybe I could double the width of the cladding and still have a fiber which could be deployed um, without too much breakage. Okay, so that's one constraint. I can see now that I can't just blow it up to be as big as my fist. I've got to keep it uh, at a size, maybe twice as much, but no more. Then you have to ask yourself, are all the cores really equal? So as I um, try to uh, change the core pitch, and I'll go back here, remind you what the um, core pitch is. Core pitch is the, defined as the distance between the centers of the two cords, as opposed to the cladding diameter. We can see that in this example, uh, they had used a cladding diameter of 225 microns and a pitch of 36, um, 37 microns. So as I try to um, make the pitch smaller, so I'm trying to make these cores denser. Try, now I have a limit on how big the area is. How many cores can I populate this area with? Well, what I'm plotting against here is the cutoff wavelength. So as I try to move these tighter, then the inner cores are starting to cut off the frequencies that can be supported. So what I like are the outer cores here because they let me use a whole lot of, of wavelengths. Here in the 1500, uh, 1.5, 1.6 uh, microns is where we have our C band in L band and our major communications band. The outer cores um, are having a cutoff wavelength, which is low enough to leave all of these wavelengths available. Um, however, the inner cores are starting to cut off there, so they may not be allowing me to use WDM across all of the channels I would like to use. So we can see that as we let the core pitch get larger, we separate the cores more. Uh, now this comes in line and the inner cores are having the same cutoff wavelength as the outer cores. So the core pitch is influencing uh, how much I can exploit each one of the cores. So also when I talk about 
how tightly I can pack the, the cores. Well, this pitch before the cores um, also increases the crosstalk. So the proximity of cores is going to lead to power in one of the cores affecting the power transmitted in the other core, uh, neighboring core. So and the more crosstalk goes up, the less independent these channels are. So when I showed you plots earlier of all the advantages of parallel um, paths, that, that uh, assumed completely independent channels, which I is not the case. So here we have a plot of core pitch and how the crosstalk level goes up as I put my uh, cores more tightly uh, packed. So there are many geometries that we can explore in order to try and overcome these constraints. So if I have a certain core uh, cladding diameter, if I have certain core pitch I should re um, respect, which geometry allows me to have you know, as few cores as possible too close together. Uh, there's a lot of hexagonal packing, but there, there are other solutions as well that have been uh, explored for various reasons. For instance, uh, there are often marks that try to uh, have reference marks so that these will also be easy to, um, to align and to couple to. So all kinds of constraints on uh, the geometry that I might want to investigate for uh, the multi-core solution. So let's go back to our plot of uh, this interpretation of Shannon, where we have transmission distance on the uh, x-axis, spectral efficiency on the y-axis, and we can see um, the different kinds of multi-core fibers which have been uh, deployed and have achieved capacity, of course, beyond the Shannon limit, because the Shannon limit was for a single core, a single truly independent core. So um, uh, we certainly are making head rows. We've uh, had demonstrations of how we can increase capacity uh, using this approach. But of course, this is only going to become commercially viable once we have the components uh, to enable uh, this solution. One of the components that uh, we're going to need is an amplifier. And for instance, uh, this is a diagram of what we call a um, side pumping uh, amplifier. So we come through and we have a doped fiber, which we wrap around the fiber, which is carrying all of these uh, cores. And uh, by this kind of coupling, we're able to uh, introduce gain into the um, uh, multi-core fiber in a cost-effective way that doesn't require fan in and fan out for amplification. So as I uh, showed you earlier, uh, we can see here um, what are the uh, achievements we've made, except that in this scale, we can also see um, the uh, product of bit rate and the distance. So uh, these show the um, these parallel lines show how we're trying to push forward uh, the technology uh, in order to achieve both uh, higher capacity and higher distance uh, for a total uh, throughput uh, metric. So so far, I've talked about multiple cores, and now I'd like to go and uh, have a discussion of what we can do with the single core in order to introduce multiple modes into our uh, spatial division multiplexing strategy. Remember that this idea of multiple cores is always good, but eventually we're going to run out of space on how we can scale. There's only so much, how so large the um, cladding can get. They're only so tightly we can pack them. And once we have achieved that increase in capacity, it will be only natural to turn to how we could combine this with the idea of having, even within a single core, to have multiple paths which could be exploited to increase capacity. So let's step back a little and look at historically 
at what have been the fibers deployed over the last 20 or 30 years. And basically there have been two types of fibers deployed. One is the typical single mode fiber, SMF, which I've discussed so far. The second is one called multi-mode fiber. And if we look at the physical dimensions of these two types of fibers, they were characterized by having a very small core, 5.8 uh, micron core, um, in the single mode fiber, and a fairly large core in the multi mode fiber, 10 times as large. The multi mode fiber is easy to couple because it's physically large core. So when I have to splice um, this fiber, it's very easy to do. If I want to connectorize this fiber, the connectors are inexpensive and easy to use. And this makes it an inexpensive solution for communications. The single mode fiber, on the other hand, is a high performance fiber. It's capable of going long distances with low loss, which is not the case when I go to scaling to a much larger um, core. So it's the physical size of the core, which is, in the case of a very small core, limiting the amount of internal reflections which can occur. In a large core, uh, you have many internal reflections which could propagate uh, coherently down the optical fiber. So in fact, the size of the uh, core in the single mode fiber was made to, was shrunk until the core was so small that there was really only one path for the light to follow uh, along the fiber. In the case of a large core solution, there are actually hundreds or thousands of paths that the light could uh, follow to get uh, through the fiber. So when I talk about a path for the light, these are essentially solutions of Maxwell's equation for propagation in the waveguide. And we call that, this path or this solution to Maxwell's equation, we call that a mode of light. So in the case of multi-mode transmission, this is an inexpensive solution developed for short links at moderate bit rates. So all of the design choices with multi-mode are made in favor of low cost. So first of all, just we went there in the first place because of the size made connectors cheaper and, low, and less expensive. But there are also other reasons that compatibility with low cost sources like uh, light emitting diodes and uh, vertical cavity um, electronic emitters, uh, vexels, and also uh, plastic fibers. So there are all kinds of solutions that were very inventive, innovative, used in multi-mode because they were, lost, they were cost effective. So I said this was for short links at moderate data rates. It's because when we were making these choices to keep costs down, we tolerated impairments that came with these compromises for cost. For instance, in a multi-mode fiber, dispersion kicks in much earlier than with a single-mode fiber. What I mean by earlier is at much shorter distances. Dispersion, chromatic dispersion in the fiber, means that some uh, wavelength contact content travels at all wavelength content travels at a different speed. Uh, how big that differential is uh, depends on um, uh, distance uh, traveled. Um, it accumulates. For instance, if I send a very short pulse, normally that would be monochromatic, that would be one wavelength, but in truth, you know, it has some thickness to it. And in the um, wavelength domain, that thickness of the uh, light means that part of that light travels slower, part of that light travels faster. What that means is what starts as a very short pulse could become a rather broad pulse. Now in SMF, uh, you can go great distances and this uh, broadening would not be significant until I get to very high baud rate, a bit rates like 40 gigabits per second. However, in um, multi-mode fiber, I have so many modes present that each one of the modes is traveling at a different speed. And so 
um, this pulse that I launch becomes broadened uh, much, much earlier than in SMF fiber. And because I have multiple modes which are um, traveling at different speeds within this fiber, it creates something like a multipath interference, and that is essentially what limits performance in the end. This idea of uh, some of the modes traveling at different lengths, creating multipaths, and interfering with itself. So when we look at multimode fiber solutions, we typically look at something that's like targeting a gigabit per second. And we're talking about a few hundred meters, certainly not kilometers. So this is the multimode solution. So we look at this and we say, well, how is this going to help me increase the capacity of my link? It seems to be stymied down at low capacity and short links, which is not going to really help me in the situation I find myself. So if we want to look for a solution in spatial division multiplexing, which takes advantage of multiple paths in a larger core, in a core supporting multiple modes, uh, we have to kind of come up with a new kind of fiber. We have to quit making the compromises that we made in the case of previous multimode fiber. So we want to find a new kind of fiber that will also enable us to go the large distances, to go uh, the higher bit rates. And in order to do that, I have to avoid the modal dispersion, this difference in travel time among uh, different um, um, modes, in order to, uh, the, which is present in the traditional multimode fiber, I have to avoid that. And what I want to do is find a way to have this mode of light actually be an independent, separate channel from the other modes of light in this new fiber. So the, the design of this new fiber has got to control the modal interactions. And how do we do this? We play with the dimensions of the uh, core and the cladding, the effective, excuse me, the reflective indices of this material, and all of this in order to limit uh, the number of modes so that we won't let ourselves get in the um, position where we have hundreds or thousands of modes traveling, which is going to lead to the, the very thing we're trying to avoid. And so we're going to target something called few mode fiber. So it sort of distinguishes that we're not going as far as multi-mode. Uh, this term is used so much for this lower quality uh, link that we want to say, yes, it's multiple modes, but it's only a few modes. It's a controlled number of modes. Uh, the design of the fiber targets a certain number of modes. Um, and so all of this is motivated by Shannon's limit, because now I'm going to design this fiber to help me get past the limit, to help me exploit the multi-core fibers by adding another multiplicative factor to increase capacity. So we go back to this idea of having a single core, but multiple modes, few modes. And you have a basic question. What kind of fiber can it support, for instance, the most independent modes? Um, what kind of modes? So there's a lot that we are still learning about spatial uh, multiplexing in fibers, especially as it concerns uh, few mode fibers. So uh, in order to uh, explain where we are with the um, differences between uh, single mode fiber and now these few mode fibers, and of course multi-mode fibers, I'm going to have to give you a little background uh, so we have some uh, vocabulary for discussing the solutions uh, that are being examined today for spatial division multiplexing. So to understand that, I'm going to go to the concept of the eigenmode of a fiber. So here is an illustration of two different kinds of fibers. It looks like a single mode fiber, it looks like a multi-mode fiber. Um, I'm changing the physical diameter uh, of the, the core. Um, so there's uh, the core has one refractive index, the cladding has another one. This is a very simple diagram with a step index change. Of course it could be um, something much more sophisticated, 
uh, with trenches, with graded index. Uh, there's all kinds of possibilities. But suffice it to say that I will have created a certain geometry which describes the design of the waveguide, the cylindrical waveguide, which is an optical fiber. And I'm going to take these physical uh, dimensions and I'm going to uh, solve Maxwell's equations to find out what kind of modes of light will travel in this fiber. So an eigenmode is a mode of light that when I launch it into the fiber, it's able to travel along the pro fiber, propagate through the fiber, comes out the other end unchanged. So uh, um, this eigenmode uh, is a vector mode of the fiber. And we can classify the eigenmodes into certain types of modes. For instance, there's TE modes, transverse electric modes. And these have uh, no electric field in the z direction, z being the propagating uh, direction. Transverse magnetic have no magnetic field in the z direction. And then after these sort of specific kinds of modes, we have what we call the hybrid modes, the EH or HE, where um, either the electric or the magnetic field actually dominates in the z-direction. So uh, we take a physical fiber design, we solve Maxwell's equations, and these solutions, the collection of solutions, are the modes supported by that fiber. So perhaps if you've studied um, any optical fibers, you will have come across the term of scalar modes. And I'd like to explain to you now what the difference is between eigenmodes and scalar modes and, and how they're related. So I can think of eigenmodes, the fundamental solutions to Maxwell's equations, as sort of the building blocks of what I call derivative modes, or these are another way of looking at uh, the light, characteristic of the light, which is being uh, supported by this fiber. And some solutions of Maxwell's equations, they sort of flock together, you know, birds of a feather flock together. Um, so there's something about these modes that make them behave similarly. So they create what we call mode groups, and these groups of modes are interrelated, and they interact heavily. And this flocking behavior all depends on the physical parameters of the fiber. So let's go back to the single mode optical fiber. We give you another way of, of looking at um, propagation of light in the fiber. Let's take the single mode fiber. In the single mode fiber, it supports two polarizations of light. So we have here the cross section of the, um, the fiber, the core, the cladding, uh, the transverse modes, longitudinal modes along the direction of propagation along the z-axis. So we launch a pulse and then we observe the pulse at the output. So in a single mode fiber, I generally get what's called a Gaussian shaped intensity profile at the output of the fiber. So this is in the spatial domain. I'm looking, if you will, into the end of the fiber and what do I see? Well, I see the light and the, it's more intense at the center and the the power sort of falls off with a Gaussian uh, shape. And when I launch this, there are actually two polarization states that could be supported, even though it's a single mode in the fiber. That mode of fiber with a Gaussian shaped intensity profile could have one of two polarizations. We use the nomenclature HE11 to mean the fundamental mode or the basic mode that is propagated, just this Gaussian profile. And here we have HE11A, HE11B. And the A and the B are just to distinguish there's two versions of this mode. And that's the polarization. And those little arrows that we see, these arrows are the polarization state for this light. So single mode optical fiber, one mode, two polarizations. And in fact, I mentioned earlier that one way that we could increase capacity was by exploiting these polarizations by multiplexing in the polarization. So that I would send information on one polarization state and then 
another set of information on the other polarization state. The two are launched together in the fiber and propagate. I guess I should mention that uh, older systems were not able to, um, older communication systems were not able to exploit polarization because there was no easy way to separate them once they got to the end of the fiber. This is an example of the kinds of modes which flock together. Well, really, they're the same mode. There's just two different polarization states. So they interact a great deal. Of course, uh, in modern systems, we can use digital signal processing, which is, allows us to separate out these polarizations. And I'll be talking to you about that again in a few minutes. But for now, let's just think about what happens here to this single solution, the fundamental mode, this Gaussian shape. Well, what happens when I increase the size of the core just a little bit? What happens to the solution to Maxwell's equations? Well, when I make the core a little bit larger, of course, I still have this solution still works. It can still propagate uh, along the fiber. But I introduce a couple of other solutions. Um, and these solutions are called the eigenmodes of this fiber. And so this would be an example of a few mode fiber. In fact, there's um, six uh, spatial modes in this example of uh, fibers, uh, six eigenmodes, which are supported by this particular design, by this few mode fiber. So six eigenmodes. And of course, we can see that one of these eigenmodes is a mode with one polarization, another polarization. And we can see the polarization states are, are more complex in these other solutions to Maxwell's equations. So come back to this idea of what's the difference between eigenmodes and scalar modes. Well, typical fibers, and what I mean is um, fibers that uh, are designed under constraints, typical constraints for um, manufacturing, uh, have what are called solutions, scalar mode solutions to Maxwell's equations. And what this is, it's a simplified version of Maxwell's equation. So we can simplify Maxwell's equation under certain uh, simplifying assumptions and some certain numerical assumptions. So this assumption that leads us to a solution which is a scalar solution is called the weakly guiding solution. And what we mean by weakly guiding, and we're talking about the relative refractive index of the cladding and the core. I remind you the light travels in the core. It's confined to the core by the cladding. And the reason that the confining takes place is because the refractive index of the cladding and the core are different. But let's suppose they're different, but they're not terribly different. Suppose the difference is just an order of 1 or 2 percent. This would be what we would call the weakly guiding solution. And under this uh, hypothesis, where this is what's going on, in that case, when I try and solve the eigenmodes, well, it's pretty easy. I can go directly to what's called the scalar modes. And when I do the scalar modes, it's really where this flocking has occurred, and they're already sort of grouped together into these mode groups uh, in the solution directly of Maxwell's equation. So remember, I said, here's my few mode fiber, and these are the underlying eigenmodes. These eigenmodes, some of them travel together so that they group and form what are called linearly polarized modes. These are the scalar solutions. So those complex um, uh, polarization orientations that we saw in the um, arrows here resolve themselves in this grouping action so that we come up with just the two simple x and y polarizations. Here we saw the x and y polarizations on our fundamental mode. And that's what we use for polarization multiplexing. So when um, I have these eigenmodes of the fiber naturally flocking together, their mode groups join and they create something called a linearly polarized mode. So a mode whose intensity profile we see here and whose um, polarization state is indicated here on the left. 
So we can see there are, in total for this fiber, six means of exploiting uh, parallel channels. So I could have the fundamental mode, which we call H E11 or LPL1, same, same mode, just different way of uh, nomenclature. Here I could use two polarizations to double the, um, to create two parallel channels. And now I have four more that I can um, exploit. Two new LP modes, LP11A and LP11B, and each one of those could have a polarization. Now, the box around them indicate that they're called near-degenerate modes. What near-degenerate modes mean is that there's um, a great deal of coupling going on around here. So here, these two polarizations, they intermingle a great deal during transmission. And all four of these solutions are going to intermingle a great deal. We can already see that this LP11A and the LP11B are very tightly related solutions to the Maxwell's equations. They're basically a spatial symmetry. Uh, if I do a rotation of the solution, I come from one mode to the other mode. So LP modes, or scalar modes, have been studied for a long time. They occur naturally. For instance, in the multi-mode um, fiber that I discussed, uh, you, when you study multi-mode fiber, you can uh, study it based on the scalar solutions to the Maxwell's equations and come up with a large set of the uh, linear polarized modes, which are supported, supported in this traditional multi-mode fiber. And as I mentioned, there could be hundreds or even thousands of these LP modes uh, supported by the multi-mode fiber. A lot easier to study numerically the LP modes than the vector eigenmodes. Uh, here in this um, uh, graphic, we have the intensity profiles of the light for uh, several uh, of the LP modes. And again, there often are groups of degenerate modes. So I could show you some intensity profiles might be several modes, but through the rotation, uh, rotational symmetry, um, they, they would look very similar. So when we talk about degenerate modes, there's some, the geometry is similar, and also the propagation speed in the fiber is similar. So there, there are many reasons why they're interacting. So remember, these modes arise from the eigenmodes. And one thing that could cause them to, to flock or to couple is any variation in the fiber index profile. So I uh, create a block of uh, glass, and I try to make that glass as uniform as possible. And then, of course, I um, draw this uh, fiber from the glass, and the drawing may be uneven. So when there's some variation in the glass, uh, this is what causes the modes to uh, couple to one another, and that the eigenmode solutions end up uh, combining to form these a coupled modes, which are called the LP modes. And there's this correspondence of you know, like which LP mode comes from which of the eigenmodes. So the LP modes are not the eigenmodes. They're a solution of Maxwell's equation, but the simplified one. And actually, they're um, this linear combination of the eigenmodes of the fiber. So now I'd like to talk about how we would want to exploit these LP modes in order to achieve spatial division multiplexing. So I said I wanted to avoid modal interactions, but I can see that that's going to be challenging with the LP modes, that uh, modal interactions are sort of integral into some of these LP modes. This is just part of their uh, way of existing. So what am I going to do about trying to achieve my goals of spatial division multiplexing, but work with these modes which I'm very familiar with, which are easy to solve, which occur naturally. Um, how, can, how can I resolve this? And the, sim the solution is to use uh, digital signal processing in order to undo the mixing that's occurring. And to do this, I'm going to use something called multiple input, multiple output processing, MIMO. So I hope that this is a reminder of something we discussed earlier. So two weeks ago, we talked about MIMO technology in the context of radio communications. And for radio communications, we had multiple antennas 
which we used to increase capacity by creating paths in the um, free space transmission from one antenna array to another antenna array. And uh, because um, each antenna saw a sum of, uh, each receive antenna saw a uh, combination of the transmitted um, uh, signals, we had to use this software, uh, this DSP, that undid the mixing. So in essence, that's what we're trying to do here with the fiber. I think I said earlier that uh, in wireless, we can't lay down a new fiber. Well, yeah, we can lay down a new fiber. What we saw earlier, that that's necess not necessarily the best scaling uh, solution. So here we're going to lay down, we can't lay down another fiber. We're just going to try and superimpose another mode inside of that fiber in order to increase capacity. And therefore, mathematically, uh, we're really describing a very similar situation and the solutions from wireless for MIMO are now being applied uh, in the optical domain in order to enable uh, spatial division multiplexing. Let me take an example. I didn't really give you a, a clear picture before of how MIMO really works, and so now I'm going to take a very simple example and step you through it so that you have a little more intuition because I'm going to go into the MIMO a little more deeply uh, in the optical case than I did in the wireless. So consider two signals, two modes in optical case, which are mixing together. In order to make this uh, example easy to figure out what's going on, easy to visualize, I'm going to take an example where one of the signals is being modulated with a binary format. There are two points in the constellation. And the other signal is being modulated with QPSK. There are four points in the constellation. So when I launch on one mode, I'm switching between plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one, uh, a BPS, BPSK modulation. When I'm modulating on the other mode, I'm actually switching between all four points. So plus and minus one in the I and the Q uh, dimension. So I launch them on separate modes. Let's think about this as polarization, for instance, on the fundamental mode, two polarizations. And I'm multiplexing, so I'm putting different data on each one of these. But it goes through the fiber and although I'm sending them on different modes, they're mixing. They're mixing together. When I get to the receiver, I have this one signal of the mixed, uh, mixed uh, modes coming into my receiver. And that receiver splits it and projects this received signal on two different mode, um, mode uh, de um, receivers, or, or it demultiplexes the modes. So it takes a single combination, splits them, puts in one mode what it thinks is the X polarization, for example, and the other what it thinks is the Y polarization. But in fact, it's not all on one or the other. They have mixed in between, and some of it hasn't gotten back to the previous one. So the outputs of these two projections are output one and output two, but each one of these outputs is a combination of these two signals. So we've had mixing in the fiber before it arrives at the receiver. So instead of having nice constellation of two points on the first output, which is what I would expect, and a constellation of four po points on the second output, because there's been so much mixing, there's actually eight points in each of them. So how am I going to do any detection in this situation? So this is what's before we start our MIMO processing. So now I'm going to use some MIMO DSP. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take um, this combination of the two here and the output two, and I'm going to start manipulating this second output. And I'm going to rotate it and scale it. I'm going to rotate it and scale it, and then I'm going to subtract it from the first output. And I'm going to keep trying different amplitudes, different phases, uh, until I can get a nice uh, identifiable signal at the result. In reality, I'd probably use a training sequence to help me find the right phase and amplitude. So let's think about this. I take the second output, 
and I start playing with rotation and amplitude, trying different ones. And I take this modified second output and I combine it with the first output and I look at the result. So now I observe the result. I'm sweeping through all the different uh, possibilities and suddenly I see four points. The constellation points after a certain uh, combination of amplitude and phase come up with the right constellation. So when I see four points I know that I have the right amplitude and phase so that I can re um, recover the original transmission. And I do the exact same uh, operation in the other branch. Now I'm going to take output 1, rotate that constellation, scale it, rotate it, add it until I come up with a nice BPSK constellation here. Then I know I've found the right pair of amplitude and phase um, to undo the combining that happened during trans transmission, during propagation. So this previous example that we just saw, we found one pair of amplitude and phase. In fact, the interactions that are happening during propagation are more complex. Uh, they're actually time varying. It's not just one amplitude and one phase that's going to undo this everything for me. Each operation of the MIMO in each branch is actually a filter. I'm trying to equalize, so it's time varying. Uh, but if I create a filter and I put the received signal through the filter, it can equalize this mixing and unmix them. Now, the complexity of my MIMO solution is based on the complexity of these equalizers. So the length of this filter depends on the level of interaction, how much these two signals have interacted, the duration of the interaction, for how long has they, have they been influencing one another, and the fiber length, so what distance has been traveled. So that's the uh, complexity of MIMO just in terms of uh, the constituent equalizer in the MIMO processor. So suppose I wanted to scale up and not just have two, as a, not just two polarizations for instance, but I want to have multiple polarizations and multiple modes. So let's say I have a total of n combined modes and polarizations. So I've transmitted them together. They arrive here. This is my receiver. The first thing I do is I demultiplex. <coughs> so I have the combined signal and I separate them out into, uh, this I think is uh, X polarization for mode 1. I do a demux so this should spit out uh, Y polarization for mode 1, etc. Mode 2, all the way down. So in order to recover what was really sent on mode 1 uh, polarization X, um, it's not directly visible because of all the interactions that have been occurring. So what I have to do is I have to look at the projections from each one of the outputs. I need n coherent receivers. After these coherent receivers, I put them each one of these outputs, I put through a filter, an equalizing filter. I take the output of the equalizing filter for each one of these uh, outputs and I combine them and voila, I have um, the first uh, channel transmission. Now, I talked about how uh, the complexity of each one of these constituent equalizers scaled based on the duration of the interaction, the level of interaction. But now if I want to scale with n, just increase the number of modes uh, increase the parallelism. Um, well, each one needs this bank of filters uh, for each one of the outputs, so for each mode output. So now I have a very large uh, MIMO solution. And the number of filters in this solution scales with the square of the number of modes. So we can think of the MIMO, electronic MIMO processing as being one of the enabling technologies that allows us to do spatial division multiplexing. Of course, I also need one of these demultiplexers. So the level of interaction will certainly be influenced by the number of modes. More modes I have, more possibility for interaction. 
But I want to talk now about also the duration of the interaction. So let's look at what happens in a fiber which supports multiple modes. One characteristic of multimode fiber is that each one of the modes has its own propagation constant. It has its own effective refractive index. And that means that, for instance, here at the top, at what we call the uncompensated span, the fundamental mode is, in this case, traveling more slowly than the first LP mode. Things all arrive at different times. This is known as differential uh, group delay. They're delayed vis-a-vis uh, -vis one another. So we can sort of do a trick and compensate this. Before we get to our receiver, we could delay one vis-a-vis -vis the other. So if um, normally the blue is arriving too late, suppose I make the green wait and I get them to line up together. And this is called a compensating span. But I do this at the end. I, I, I realign the uh, pulses. Well, the problem is that these two pulses are not independent. Here I show them as being un not influencing one another, but traveling at a different speed. In fact, what happens is that there's this intermixing that happens during the propagation. And because of that, information is passing from one mode into the other mode. And they're all traveling and they're walking off from one another, we could say. And because of that, it creates um, this sort of pedestal response. Instead of having two different impulses, I have a pedestal response, a thickness which um, has to be compensated. So when I say that the interactions are time varying, the length of this interaction becomes the length of the filter I need to equalize these interactions. So I need as many taps in my filter uh, to cover the time of these interactions. The interesting thing is um, that the level, how much mixing occurs, actually influences how long the duration is of the occurrence, which is not necessarily very intuitive. So, in fact, the more and more coupling I get, it could have the tendency to actually shrink the length of the pedestal. But it's still present. Uh, but it might make the equalizers a little less long. So, in order to um, use MIMO processing, I have to have channel state information. I have to know about how much interaction there is going on. I said I could use a training sequence to try and help me find the good uh, amplitude and phase rotation, uh, in this case a time varying amplitude and phase uh, duration. And to do that uh, we can uh, characterize our link and uh, use that characterization in order to uh, compensate in the MIMO processor. Here's a uh, matrix kind of representation where we have um, modes along one side, mode along the other side. So I launch uh, a 0, 1 mode, and then I look in, at my receiver and I see, do I receive it? So here I've launched a 1, 1 mode, but if I look at my LP01 receiver, I see that I have a pulse here and it has the pedestal that is as long as the interaction. So this is a way for me to visualize what it is my MIMO processing is going to have to undo. Of course, in these, there's no pedestal, but it's because the interactions are really instantaneous. There's a whole lot of interactions going on, uh, for instance, like between polarizations. Uh, this actually did not show polarizations. If I wanted to spread out and show the interactions on the polarization level, I would have actually a 6 by 6 matrix instead of a, a 3 by 3. So here I'm actually exploring the polarization, try to separate those as well. And so when I do my full MIMO processing for this example of um, one fundamental mode, two LP, um, one one modes, uh, pardon me. Ah, excuse me. Uh, fundamental modes, LP01 modes, 
and the two LP11A, LP11B modes, uh, in this case, I would need 36 equalizers in order to um, have good performance. So here's a block diagram of what we see as a potential solution for space, spatial division multiplexing, space division multiplexing with LP modes. So I would have a multiplexer that takes independent uh, data, rotates each one into a spatial mode, and combines them into one output to be propagated on a fiber. There are solutions for how we might uh, create um, amplifiers, doped amplifiers, which are uh, equally amplifying each one of the modes with a single amplifier. We're going to want to do some networking with this uh, spatially multiplexed signal. So we're going to want to have a wavelength selective switch or some kind of reconfigurable optical add drop multiplexer in order to uh, do some routing. And then, of course, at the receive end, we need this spatial demultiplexer, uh, which feeds this n by n MIMO uh, solution. And I can use you know, any number of LP modes that I might want to. We've looked at the first three, but there are um, some demonstrations with even more modes that I'll tell you a little bit about. So for LP mode, components to couple, pretty good. LP modes have existed for a while. We're pretty good at generating them and coupling into them. In fact, there is this nice solution for how to couple into um, this few mode fiber by actually taking uh, single core fibers and sort of gluing them together, not exactly, and stretching them and tapering them uh, adiabatically so that we can create, um, uh, gradually create the modes. This solution actually creates a whole lot of interaction between the modes, but since we're using MIMO processing, this doesn't uh, necessarily increase um, complexity. I mentioned that we're going to need some wavelength selective switches, and there's a lot of development of the uh, different technologies uh, being examined uh, for this application for LP modes as well. So we've seen that LP modes can multiply the capacity, multiplicative factor, but the modes interact, and because of these interactions, we need to go to MIMO. Uh, when we look at switching, because we need in the MIMO all of the spatial modes to be present, that means that the wavelengths and the modes cannot be switched independently. Kind of a drawback with LP modes. All, LP, all modes on a given wavelength must switch together so that when they get to the receiver, even though I'm on one wavelength, I have all the modes, I can use my MIMO processing, undo the, the um, interactions of those modes. Here's the, um, one of the most uh, high capacity demonstrations done with LP modes. There were 15 LP modes here. It's the intensity profile down at the bottom. They used two different kinds of coupling uh, strategies. One was uh, this uh, photonic lamp lantern, they call it, based on uh, bundling uh, fibers, stretching them, tapering them. And then they had an integrated um, waveguide solution as well. So let's tell you about the complexity of the digital signal processing necessary for this experiment. There were uh, 30 channels, so they needed 30 by 30 MIMO, so 900 equalizers. Each equalizer had 1,800 taps. It was a fractionally spaced taps, which means that each equalizer was running at twice the transmission rate. So I think this was like um, 60 gigabits per second, but the processing would have had to do if it was in real time at 120 uh, giga. Um, samples and that would have been uh, really difficult. And on top of that, all of the channels must be synchronous. So they achieved this. It's a very, very exciting experiment. But it did require a great deal of complexity. So how could I reduce the complexity if I didn't need MIMO? Well, in the best case, if they really were independent channels, um, I'd still need 30 equalizers. I'd need one per mo. So I say it scales as the square, but of course, just the nominal solution goes linearly. So it's really like the added complexity is linear in the number of uh, channels 
or mode polarization combination. So if we were to use, um, but that would be rare because if I did that, 30 equalizers, that means that I'd actually have the polarization separated, which is not necessarily the way we do it. We sort of have accepted that polarizations will mix. So typically we'd need 15 equalizers, and each of these equalizers would be like a two by two equalizer. So this is not what we're doing in this case of LP modes. LP modes, we're doing something more like this. But an alternative would be to move into a lower complexity uh, DSP based on this approach. And so just to return to the uh, note I made earlier about the switching functions for um, LP modes with MIMO processing, uh, the MIMO receiver Excuse me. The MIMO must, receiver must see all of the modes. So maybe I can use a standard um, WDM MUX like exists already. I've come up with some new mode MUXs, LP modes, not too difficult. And I've got this nice new fiber I've designed. Um, but now what happens is I have to come up with a device which is a modal DMUX. Okay. And then this modal DMUX has to separate wavelengths because if I want to drop a wavelength in my um, optical network, I have to drop a wavelength, but that wavelength has got to have every single one of the modes that carried it so that all of these modes could come in so that I could DMUX the modes and then put it into my MIMO and be able to uh, take out, uh, recover the data on each one of them, which means that the granularity of my switching available here is not very great. I have to keep a whole flow, all of the modes. So I'll make a multiplicative factor, but I cannot uh, keep the granularity. The granularity is going to go up by that same multiplicative factor. Uh, the modal DMUX that I'm talking about is very complex because of the requirement for all modes to stay together. So the first step, separate all the modes. Second step for each mode, pick out the wavelength. So I need a wavelength switch for each one of my modes. Once I've got them, recombine them all, and then send them back to the output port. So this modal DMUX is, by its nature, going to be uh, fairly complex, expensive, perhaps, and lossy uh, device in order uh, to do um, this, this function. So I said that the LP solution, the, they had modal interaction, which required MIMO. And the switching, they couldn't be switched independently, the wavelengths and the modes. So the question is, is there a solution where no MIMO would be required, where I could have more flexible routing? And so that will be the last subject that I want to talk to you today, is how we might try and achieve this goal of doing spatial division multiplexing. But keeping good granularity for switching and avoiding the DSP um, burden of full email processing. So to do that, I'm going to introduce you another set of modes. Uh, we saw the LP, the linear polarized node modes. They're very well studied. They were the first solution envisioned for spatial division multiplexing. Orbital angular momentum modes actually were discovered fairly recently in the last 10 years. And it's a very recent subject of research, sort of, to characterize how these modes in a fiber um, might be exploited for SDM. And so why do I think that these OAM modes, orbital angular momentum modes, why do I think they might be better? Why do I think I might be able to avoid MIMO? So I, in order to explain why I think inherently OAM might be better than LP modes, let me go back to this whole discussion about eigenmodes. I said the LP modes were derivative of the eigenmodes. In fact, they're a linear combination of the eigenmodes. So here are um, the fundamental mode, the first uh, LP mode, two polarizations, and then the next LP mode. Um, I said that some of them flock together, some of the eigenmodes flock together, and that they, these formed what we call LP modes. Um, I gave you some nomenclature, T, E, T, M, E, H. These were the ways of naming the eigenmodes. So I bring those concepts together here to let you know that the fundamental mode 
is a vector mode, is an eigenmode. The first LP mode is actually the sum of two different eigenmodes. So they combine together and they form this LP11x mode. So if I do the solution to full Maxwell's equation, I get these vector modes and then I combine them, I'm going to come up with is the solution of the scalar version because this is what happens uh, in propagation. Um, so the each one of these LP modes is a linear combination of some collection of eigenmodes. Okay, sounds simple. Um, well, first thing you'll notice is these two degenerate modes, these modes which have this uh, symmetry, geometric symmetry, um, they share the same eigenvector, eigenmode. So, of course, there's going to be crosstalk between these two because they're riding on the back of the same mode. So they're traveling on the same highway, they're going to intermingle. Each one of these eigenmodes has as a solution its own propagation. Remember I said that uh, I showed you the uh, time of travel of a pulse was different for a different mo mode. This beta is the uh, propagation constant for each one of these eigenmodes. And we can see that this LP mode is actually made from two eigenmodes which travel itself at different speeds. Before I was talking about the walk-off between the fundamental mode and the first uh, LP mode. Now I'm talking about just within an LP mode, there's this um, combination of highways at different speeds. So we can say that there's this thing, birefringence means that this is traveling at different speeds. We give it the name birefringence. There's modal birefringence, sort of broadening of the pulse just due to uh, this, and there's crosstalk. So LP modes sort of inherently are going to have this kind of behavior. Now let's see what happens with OAM modes. OAM modes are also just linear combinations of the eigenmodes. The eigenmodes are, you know, a, a unique uh, basis for the uh, modes in a, an optical fiber. Linear polarization modes are an equivalent basis based on it, and I can do another one where I use OAM modes. So let's look at OAM modes and what their constituent um, eigenmodes are. First of all, the OAM modes have a very particular um, intensity profile. They're, in general, donut-shaped, except, of course, for the fundamental mode. Fundamental mode is the same in all representations. But the OAM modes of different orders are made up from a linear combination of uh, eigenmodes, and these eigenmodes are very, very closely related. These eigenmodes are basically the same solution, except one is an um, uh, even function, the other one is a, an odd function. It's basically, one's a cosine, one's a sine, the same solution. And they're this um, combination of these cosine, sine-like uh, solutions. And each one of these solutions, because of this sameness, has the same propagation constant. So although this OAM mode is a linear combination of eigenmodes, at least they're all traveling at the same speed. There's no walk-off between them. So because of that, we can think of it also as having an effective uh, index of refraction, which is uh, well-defined, unique for uh, the OAM mode. So each one of these M OEM modes has its own uh, effective the refractive index, which is directly related to the eigenmode. So this effective refractive index uh, allows me to characterize sort of the behavior of these modes. And I can think of trying to design a fiber so that I fence off these modes from one another. I keep them from interacting with one another so that I can keep my interactions low. And this um, forming of scalar modes, I said before, um, why you might naturally have them flock together. Well, if I can create a fence, these eigenmodes won't be able to flock together and form LP modes. Instead, they'll have a tendency to form OAM modes. So I just have to design my fiber the correct way. So these fences that I'm trying to establish so that there won't be interaction, they won't be forming LP modes, Fences are that this effective index has got to be separated 
by a large enough amount. And I know you're going to tell me 10 to the minus 4 sounds like a very small number, but actually uh, getting an effective index uh, difference greater than 10 to the minus 4 is a challenge. But we can come up with fiber designs that achieve this. So these OAM modes, if I have a typical few-mode fiber where LP modes are generated, it's because these LP modes are generated because it violated this condition. It wasn't, the separation wasn't far, uh, large enough. And because it wasn't large enough, all these other factors I discussed caused um, the eigenmodes to interact due to non-idealities in the fiber. Um, so um, normal fibers are not going to, normal, typical fibers are not going to form OAM modes. They're going to have a tendency to form LP modes. We have to change the design, put up fences to force the propagation to form OEM modes instead of LP modes. So just to recap this discussion of OEM and LP, OEM modes, it's possible to come up with a divine design that fences them off from one another because each one of them is based on a single eigenmode. And so since it's a single eigenmode, I can sort of separate out those eigenmodes. The LP modes, not like that. The LP modes are formed from, well, in two modes are formed from the same eigenmodes. They're, they're the same eigenmodes contributing to each one. So no matter what I do in my design, I'm not going to make these things separate because they have at their basis. They're sharing a component. So the effective index cannot be shaped to avoid coupling. So uh, this is why... Uh, OAM modes are a more interesting candidate to look for a solution for uh, a MIMO-free or reduced MIMO uh, solution. So maybe you're curious um, what orbital angular momentum means. Uh, I'll just take a little uh, side discussion for two minutes to give you a little uh, background on OAM. Uh, OAM this is the wave front, and in the fundamental mode, the wave front, this intensity profile, all travels at the same speed along the um, transversal axis. When we have an orbital angular momentum mode, then the phase front, this is the phase front, uh, the intensity um, propagates there, and now the phase we can see is unchanged. But in this one, as we're propagating, we're creating um, a face front that's rotating as it propagates. And uh, depending on the order of the OAM mode is how many rotations uh, occur uh, in a given um, time uh, along this projection. And there's a, a lot of interest in orbital angular momentum. But as I said, it's a fairly recent discovery. And uh, one of the curious aspects of OEM is that the third order OAM mode actually resembles closely a fusilli pasta. So here we'll take that fusilli pasta mode and uh, just give you an illustration. This here on the left is the intensity profile of the um, mode in time as it travels along the axis and on the right is the phase and we can see the phase uh, rotating. Different colors represent the phase. Um, so we have the annular field intensity in the simulation and the phase front is rotating. And we also have circular polarization. If you look at these little uh, arrows that represent the polarization, you can see them sweeping uh, in a circular, a circular manner. Um, the, again, I said I get to the name of orbital angular momentum. And it's because uh, the electromagnetic signal, the, the light, carries both energy and momentum. And the momentum can be both linear and angular. The angular momentum, so we're zooming in on the angular contribution, it has a spin, a spin part, and that spin is related to the polarization. And it has an orbital part, which is uh, related to the uh, spatial distribution. And so for that reason, uh, we've already had the name of polarization for the spin angular momentum, uh, but we gave the name of ang up orbital angular momentum to the phase structure. 
So we've designed some OEM fibers here at Laval uh, University. Um, what's nice about OEM fibers is that the index profile, I said it's a donut shape, it's round, sort of matches the um, uh, profile of, an of, of, a, of a fiber. And so we're thinking of creating a core, which is also ring shaped so that it matches the intensity profile. So instead of being a solid core, that's one of the motivations for using a ring shape. There are other reasons as well. Um, we want to make sure to have vector models which are well separated with effective indices. We want to avoid having them flock together, forming LP modes. So we design our fibers to have this ring shape. Also to have um, at least a 10 and minus 4 index separation between the modes we're designing. Um, in order to get a big effective index separation, in order to build these fences, in order to do that, I have to have some room to work. And the way that I create room to work is I create a bigger effective, a refractive index difference between the core and the cladding. Remember I said the weakling guiding principle? They're different. It is confined, but the difference is only 1%. If I want to achieve a high um, separation, a high fence, well, then I've got to force this um, difference between the cladding and the core to have a bigger difference so that there's a bigger spacing so that I can keep my eigenmodes spaced well apart. And so for sure this, uh, I can no longer look at solutions of the scalar solutions to Maxwell's equations. I need a whole uh, set of design parameters uh, around that. So the ring core of fibers at Laval, these photos I'll be showing you, uh, there's the cladding is the larger circular area and the highlighted color there is the waveguide. So we created one with uh, an inverse parabolic graded index profile, sort of a smooth gradient profile. You see a little bit here. We did another one with a hollow core so that actually the center is air. So it's like a hollow tube. And then we have the propagation here. And that was um, actually able to achieve the most modes that have ever been reported. Um, and we also um, have some ring core, uh, so uh, with a cladding core. Um, and so we've been experimenting here at Laval on these uh, different fibers to achieve uh, MIMO free um, or solutions that do not have the complexity of a MIMO solution that scales with the number of modes. So just to summarize the difference between LP modes and OAM modes, LP side, it's been around for a while. There's already a rich set of components, especially for coupling and multiplexing. Um, but the LP modes necessarily interact. So they have high crosstalk. And because of that, eventually the number of channels that we can support are going to be limited by the complexity of the DSP. We can't just scale up to a size, uh, an arbitrary size. And it requires MIMO processing and multiplexed receivers. All the receivers have to be coordinated. OAM, early stages of research, really new. A lot of coupling issues. We don't even know how to couple this light into the fiber. Um, but the eigenmodes uh, that form OAM modes can be designed to have lower crosstalk. And so perhaps better channel count. That's one of the interesting parts. So we hope that we would have MIMO processing would not be necessary, so the DSP and the receiver architecture would be easier. So there are really two different strategies. One strategy on the LP side is sort of to embrace strong interactions. Have a lot of interactions so that the interaction time is shorter. We can try and keep the complexity of MIMO from getting too big. And it relies on uh, MIMO. We allow our multiplexers to create interactions because it doesn't matter. The interactions are going to be undone. OAM modes, completely different strategy. We're targeting low fiber interactions. But what are we going to do when we have to splice these things together? If we don't get those components right, then we'll just introduce interactions at that point and we'll still need MIMO processing. So two approaches, subject of research, and the uh, final answer is not known yet. So that brings me back to our taxonomy of solutions. And let's look over them one last time. Single core, multiple modes, multiple core, or combination, multiple core, multiple modes. And we can see uh, now another way of, of summarizing what's going on in this activity. 
And in this case, we're looking at how densely we can pack um, channels into a given geometry. And in the other side, we're looking at how uh, spectrally efficient we can be. And we can see that the solutions are um, multi-core. So multi-core, we can get certain in a number of cores in a given geometry. But of course, when we go to multi-mode, um, uh, we might uh, be able to achieve um, even more density, but we're not going on up in the spectral efficiency. And the reason for the difference between these two is that the crosstalk is higher in multi-mode than it is in multi-core. Multi-cores have a lot less interaction between their cores than we do in the multi-mode. The multi-mode interactions are just higher. So that means that the crosstalk limitation is higher in the multi-mode than it is in the multi-core. Of course, the single mode, we can give very high spectral efficiencies, but the spatial density is not very high. And then we expect to see uh, sort of a sweeter spot, uh, maybe this one, comp uh, combining the two, but we, we can see we're not getting all the gain that we hope to. And this is a plot I showed you earlier where we had gone, the blue ones were the multi-core, and you can see that the multi-core are still the largest uh, increases in capacity have come from using multiple core. But there are very interesting results still with multi-core, multi-mode, but at fairly short uh, distances. So finally, I'd just like to end with the recognition that network networking for spatial division multiplexing is still in its infancy. While we are making lots of headway into uh, spatial division multiplexing for multiple cores, uh, we still don't know how we're going to um, integrate solutions for the switches in order to make this uh, very cost effective. Um, although there's still lots of, lots of uh, uh, space for improvement there. Uh, also in the modal division multiplexing, so cores, multiple cores will be our first uh, breakway into um, spatial division multiplexing, but when we hit a wall there and we know the walls exist, we're going to need to turn to mode multiplexing, and there we have a lot more questions that remain about uh, how we're going to be doing the networking, uh, whether we want to stay um, how we're going to develop components which are compatible with uh, multiple modes and multiple wavelengths. And then once we have the components which are able to uh, manipulate both wavelength and mode, then how we're going to be able to deploy them in a network to achieve the goals of the network and maximize not just the physical layer, but also the um, programmability and uh, virtualization of uh, these technologies is is really uh, yet to be addressed, or a very limited uh, uh, amount of research in that direction. So in conclusion, we've looked at spatial multiplexing, and the motivation for this was overcoming the Shannon limit, in fact, overcoming the nonlinear Shannon limit for high capacity fiber communications. And the goal in spatial multiplexing, though, is not just to overcome the limit, but to also do that in a way that lets us bring down the cost per bit. It's really the cost per bit which matters, not just the capacity. And we saw that multiple cores in a single fiber, there have been many demonstrations that shows that this is a viable solution. We have a good understanding of the constraints, but there's still a lot of work to be done to create the ecosystem of components of enabling technologies to bring this to commercialization. Uh, modal multiplexing is uh, even newer than the multiple core solutions. Uh, we're still discussing, looking at whether we want uh, solutions which are uh, MIMO or MIMO free. Perhaps a solution for MIMO would be a good solution for longer distance, point to point. But in the networking segment, perhaps we'd like to go to something that's more MIMO free. Uh, so there's some segmentation of the research looking at different markets, uh, short haul, long haul. Uh, there's some issues in the granularity of switching, how we're going to be able to keep our granularity, and indeed in the technologies to be used uh, for those switching solutions. So 
uh, in the net, pushing this into the network is, is, is quite a ways away from, from today. But uh, important to have the message of software-defined networks get to um, the technology uh, developers in order to make sure that uh, we're developing, looking early on into solutions which are compatible with a reconfigurable network. Um, so finally, many years away from commercialization, but still uh, a very promising avenue for future research.